good morning, uh, guten Morgen, uh, bonjour, uh, buongiorno, and apologies to everyone from around Europe who are joining us today, and to everyone around the world. That's about as much as far as my languages go. Uh, oh, sorry, Kia uh, Git to all the Irish uh, participants. Uh, welcome to today's conference. Uh, today we're looking, we have a two hour online conference and we're going to look at different aspects of Eurovision. Uh, this being uh, a conference that's organized by geographers. There's going to be a good bit of geography involved in it today. Uh, just to note, I'll mention this again, uh, just to note folks that today's conference is has been organized by our uh, colleagues at the Minute University uh, Social Sciences Institute. And thanks very much to Anne and Orla for all their work in putting this together. Uh, if it was down to me, there would be no conference because I'm technologically useless, as you'll probably find throughout the next few hours when I keep unmuting myself at the wrong time. But anyway, uh, we have two hours of Eurovision discussion, some content as well around 10 o'clock today. Um, just to say, uh, we have a panel with us today. So the organizers are myself. I'm Adrian Kavna. I'm one of the lecturers here in Minute University in the Department of Geography. I've co-organized this conference uh, along with Keelan Darcy, who's also from Minute uh, University Department of Geography, and you'll see and hear from Keelan uh, fairly soon. Uh, we're joined today by three other panelists, three other guest panelists. Uh, Rebecca Bile, who's also from Minute University, from the Frebel department, if I pronounce that right, Rebecca. Uh, we're also joined by Johnny Fallon from Car Communications. He's a, a veteran of our Minute conferences, Eurovision conferences at this stage. I think this is Johnny's fourth conference. And we're also joined as well by Michael Keady, who's the head of delegation, the Irish Eurovision head of delegation. And Michael's also, if he's another veteran of our conferences. I think this is Michael's third conference. So this is the second year in a row we've had the online conference. Uh, last year was mainly due to COVID. Uh, this year, COVID's still hanging around, but it also, I think, allows, hopefully, uh, when we start to hear from people in the chat section, I think it also allows uh, people from around Europe and around the world to join in if they want to. Uh, I was looking at the attendance list and uh, the attendance list yesterday and some interesting uh, countries represented there. I see we have, uh, we have someone from Slovenia, we have someone from Croatia, someone from Denmark, uh, someone from Germany, and, and there's probably others of you out there from other different European countries. Uh, and I couldn't make out where you're from because I couldn't, it's probably a hotmail.com email address. So uh, as I said, today, it's a smaller panel than we had last year. There's more of a chance, hopefully, for, for those of you who are listening in to get involved. Uh, and hopefully you get involved in this first session. The first session is basically, we're going to talk to the panel about uh, how they got involved in Eurovision, their Eurovision memories. Uh, and their favorite Eurovisions. But uh, if I'd, I'd like to invite as well, I would like to hear from all the people who are here in attendance today. So I'd like to invite you all, if you want to contribute, you should be able to put in questions in the chat section. But if you just want to say, look, I'm, uh, we'll say, John from Liverpool, uh, from United Kingdom. Uh, and just say, if you want to say my favorite Eurovision memory or my favorite Eurovision memory involving my own home country, uh, if there's anything we're discussing about that you want to share in this session, please do. And I'll try my best to get everyone, uh, everyone's comments included uh, this morning, uh, so long as it's not uh, obviously offensive comments. Uh, I see Nathan, Nathan uh, Cassidy has asked about Ireland qualifying. Uh, uh, we'll probably get to that in the last section, eight when we're doing the jukebox jury, so that'll be around 11 o'clock, so we will get to that, uh, but definitely we'll touch on that, so thanks for that. So any comments, or, or if you just want to say hi in the chat box, and as I said, if you want to share uh, what Eurovision means to you, what's your favourite Eurovision memory, uh, your why, 
what's your favorite Eurovision country even. So please do feel free to get involved. Okay, anyway, we're going to start by talking to the panel. And as I said, feel free to contribute. Uh, so I'll talk with some of the panelists and I'll hand over to Keelan to talk with others. Uh, so I'm going to start off, first of all, by introducing uh, uh, Michael. Uh, so Michael has joined us. Uh, Michael is the RT, uh, from RTE, uh, the Irish National Public Broadcaster. Michael is the head delegation uh, for Ireland at Eurovision. Uh, so um, I'm just going to introduce Michael. So hello, Michael. And again, thanks, Michael, for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Thanks for having me again. So, Michael, uh, just getting aside from the job, we'll talk a bit about the job in a minute, but personally yourself, uh, even before you took over as head of the delegation, uh, what, what did your vision, what, what excited you about your vision? Well, um, my, I've been thinking about this since I saw your agenda there, and my, um, I suppose my formative Eurovision memory would be Johnny Logan winning in 1980, um in in the hague i think it was and uh, i just remember at the time the excitement that that generated in a pretty um gray and bleak ireland of the at the start of the 1980s you know which was we were facing we didn't know it i think at the time but we were facing a pretty bleak decade um and um this was kind of um our a sort of a, a something that injected a lot of excitement in certainly amongst sort of the the in the in the school I was in, you know, where where we we felt like we had the eyes of the world were on Dublin, and we really this was our time to kind of you know and, and Ireland as well, obviously, and this was our time to shine, and we were we um, we had an opportunity, I suppose, to showcase our our country and our culture to um, a Europe that was pretty indifferent, I think, to us at that stage. Um, and uh, so that was kind of the thing. I just remember uh, Johnny winning, and it was it was um, you know he was he represented a a sort of a, a, a modern um, you know relatively useful at that stage, I suppose. I, can't, I don't know what age he was at that point, but um, you know, and and, and forward looking kind of Ireland. You know, he was on top of the pops. You know, those kind of um, programs which were which were hugely influential for uh, me and um, some of my my music loving peers at that stage. And Adrian, I can see. Uh, might might have had the same effect on him, um, so that was kind of my first um, my first real introduction to Eurovision, and then I I, I never really thought about it until until uh, you know that string of wins. Then you know when Johnny won again, obviously in the late eighties, and then we had that string of wins in the nineties, and then when I I was uh, fortunate enough to be asked to get in, involved in it as well. I mean that was that was really when my my deep deep immersion in Eurovision kind of took off, you know, um, sometime around uh, 2007 or 2008. Um, but for, as a, so that was my kind of early sort of memory and I, I'm not gonna hog the the, um, the show here too much, um, Adrian, but the other standout Eurovision memory for me is the show that the Danes put on in Copenhagen in um, 2014, just as a television, producer and director, that was a show that really uh, blew my mind in terms of the scale and the the technology and just what you could do um, in an abandoned shipyard, you know, that they had converted, you know, so that's basically me in a nutshell there, Adrian. So Michael, you're the head of delegation at for Ireland. Uh, would you mind, uh, just before we hand over to Keelan, who'll talk with Johnny, uh, would you mind just telling us what the job involves? What does a head of delegation do? Well, it's it's um, it's, it's really a lot of it is kind of a, a, a sort of a, an administrative kind of role and a, a sort of um, it's it's like um, being I know people sometimes compare it to being like the chef they keep in an, an Olympic team, you know your job is to keep the show on the road, is to um, make sure that we have everything we need to put on the best possible show. And my job is really to make sure that the that I facilitate the artists to the best possible extent that I can, you know? So I, 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 I put them in touch with the, with the best possible people um, that they feel they need. You know, we, we um, I try, if they have a creative vision, I do my, you know, I bend over backwards to try and make that creative vision happen within obviously within the budgetary constraints that RTE 
put on me. Um, so that's kind of it at the moment. My job is about 80% travel agent um, because we're just about to send off um, our, uh, our artist, Brooke, to, uh, she's going to London tomorrow, then she's off to Tel Aviv on Monday, then she's going to Amsterdam the following Saturday, and then she is back for a week, and then she's going to Madrid, and then we're obviously all going to Turin. So I have to organise all of the logistics around that. I mean, in terms of, you know, making sure that we pay the hotel in Turin, making sure that we pay the, the um, you know, that we have our flight tickets, that we have all of that kind of stuff that we need uh, when we're there. So that's really what it is at the moment. It's, it, it's sort of 90% administrative sort of stuff and just making sure that we have everything we need for Brooke. And Brooke is actually one of a small number of acts. A lot of, uh, there's some countries aren't doing any of the pre-parties, but a lot yeah. are doing a few, but Brooke's doing them all. Which well, is I, I, do you know what? I, I, a few years ago, I was kind of, um, you know, wasn't necessarily um, too gone on the idea of going to all these uh, pre, pre-Eurovision parties. I thought they might have been a little bit of a distraction from the main event. Uh, I've completely changed my mind. I actually think that they are like warm-up events for the, for the Eurovision. And I think the more experience we can get Brooke in front of crowds, in the run-up to Eurovision, you know, it, it'll it'll stand to her no end because it's, you know, I mean, it's it's hard to comprehend uh, if you've never actually been in uh, in on the inside of a Eurovision, how um, big a thing it is to walk out onto a stage without any thing, any preparation, you know, in 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 that sense that you've never ever performed in 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 front of huge crowds. It it is it is a head wreck, you know. So um, anything we can do to prepare her. For that, I think is 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 only is only um, you know to her benefit, and particularly like because the shows are getting bigger and bigger. I mean, the one in in um, Barcelona had about four or five hundred, I think, in it. The one in <clears throat> London is going to have probably twice that, maybe. The one in Tel Aviv, there's an arena with twenty thousand people um, uh, taking you know uh, attending it, and you know so so those things are are all to her benefit, definitely. So that's great. Sorry, I keep on muting myself. So thanks for that, Michael. Uh, we'll be talking to Michael again later on uh, during the last few panels. Uh, I'm now going to hand over, introduce Keelan, who's the co-organizer of this conference, who's the brains behind the whole thing. And uh, Keelan is going to talk with Johnny now about similar a similar topic to what we're talking about there with Michael, uh, favorite memories, what Eurovision means to him. But uh, just before you introduce Johnny Keelan, maybe just to say hi to the uh, viewers. And by the way, Nathan noted his favorite memory entry of all time is Rhino Shocknessy uh, in 2018. So thanks for that. Uh, maybe just introduce yourself by your noting your own what your vision means to you, your own favorite memories, and then we'll hand over to Johnny and yourself to have a discussion. So thanks for that. Thanks, Adrian. Um, great shout, Nathan, as well. Um, I thought that was a very good entry. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm Keelan. Um, I wouldn't call myself the brains behind this conference. I would owe that to Adrian, but thank you, Adrian. Um, I suppose your vision to me, um, just to give a brief um, meaning behind it, it was very much like a thing that I did with my family. Um, like, I, I forget when the, fir the first time I remember the Eurovision was when Turkey won it um, and I just I love that song and it was something that actually myself and my brother bonded over as well the Eurovision so really that's what it was to me um, and it was something that lived on we love elections in this house and um, so the voting was always amazing um, but yeah so that's really what it was to me and um, so I'm now going to speak with Johnny Fallon with Car Communication so um, Johnny is, an, uh, as Adrian said earlier on, he's kind of been to every single one of these that we've done and he's been a fantastic contributor. Um, so I'm really looking forward to speaking to you, Johnny. But just to start, what is your vision to you? Uh, I'm probably very similar to yourself, uh, Keelan, and that uh, it's, it's about family, you know, from the earliest memories, it was about family, it's about sitting down, watching something, a, a night's entertainment that was shared and there was something, you know, there was just some different about it special unlike so many other things be it sports or anything else it was competitive but without that kind of 
you know, that real edge that goes with competition where you actually get you quite angry about things. No, it was, it, you couldn't be angry about it, even if you got a bit like, oh, oh it was unfair. It was a bit, yeah, but it's ridiculous to get annoyed about it. It is your vision. So it allowed you to be competitive and just enjoy it. I mean, the memories that I, I, I've got for, uh, again, similar to, to Michael, I, I probably remember Johnny Logan. Uh, winning for that that first time but I'd also say there was that trend in the the 80s as well not only of Johnny Logan winning the Eurovision that time uh, with Watson another year but then you had Linda Martin coming close with uh, Terminal 3 flights on time Liam Riley coming close with somewhere in Europe you know we were always there or thereabouts and of course in your own country that adds a huge amount to it when you're, you're, you're you have those kind of memories but Equally, I grew up with so many songs of the Eurovision that became soundtracks to summer, you know, Ambition Frieden, you know, the German winner in, in the 80s, Bobby Sox, Let It Swing, those kind of songs just were on repeat. And, you know, you bought the tape or the record or whatever, and you said, oh, that's going to play in the house all summer now after hearing it on Eurovision. And I suppose there's one memory, though, that, that, that stands out for me, not from the songs, but was the, the, the Eurovision in Mill Street when we, we, Ireland won that Eurovision down in Mill Street, which was unusual and that it wasn't in the capital and it was in a, an unusual space and everything else. But it was the actual reaction of the Irish audience in Mill Street when win that you have the tea shock, you have everybody, and everybody just breaks into Ole, Ole, Ole. And that was the only song we could sing in Ireland at the time. When we were excited, people just broke into Ole, Ole. In the pub, you know, after mass, at the Eurovision, didn't matter. You're excited, it was just a round of Ole, Ole broke out. And it was all we could do. And you have the, the ministers, everybody just singing Ole, Ole. And that real sense of, you know, Ireland at that stage kind of emerging into a slightly more prosperous we hadn't hit celtic tiger or anything but we we're beginning to get a sense post italian 90 all of that thing washing through over those years that ireland you know every sense of god we're great in ireland aren't we we're a mighty little country and that, that that fed into that kind of confidence building thing that i think helped ireland enormously throughout throughout the 90s yeah uh, and one thing i i always enjoy about yourself during these conferences is, is you're very good at knowing what um, makes a good performance. So to you, Johnny, what makes a good performance at uh, Eurovision or a performance stand out? Well, I think, it, you know, it differs from year to year, you know, because um, one of the things that people always say, one of the things people say to me about Eurovision now is people say, you know, oh, I don't like it. You know, I don't think it's a song contest anymore, you know, and it's all that kind of thing they'll say to you. And the truth is Eurovision is a song contest, was a song contest. But it was always more than a song contest, and it's well, always will be more than a song contest. There is a little bit about a song having to have a zeitgeist that goes with the time, whether that's it's fast or it's slow or it touches on a certain lyric or mood. It has to have that winning songs touch something that just everybody right across audiences goes. That's the mood where we're, we're, we've got right now. But then in terms of the, the actual performance, it has to stand out. And, and as Adrian would, would point out, a running order can be important in that, you know, Having a slow song that's amid a lot of slow songs, difficult. Having a fast song suddenly come in there can make all the difference to just the, the impact of it. Um, but most of all, I think there has to be a connection with the audience. Audience has to feel something from the singer that they're saying, yeah, you're either through the lyrics, you're suddenly saying something that touches me, or if it's just through the music, it's the fact that I can clap along, there's a beast, there's something. And there has to be, for me, something different in it, something that makes people go, you know, hold on, that key change was, was the traditional way it was done in the past. Now it could be with the staging and all that kind of thing. But it's that piece that makes you sit back and go, this is good. This is good. Yeah, I'm liking it. I'm liking it. And then all of a sudden you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. It, that, now it's brilliant. You know, that's what audiences love. And they feel they're part of the performance. That's It's, it's absolutely critical to them. Perfect. And just before I pass back to Adrian, who's going to uh, speak with Rebecca, what has been a standout performance for you in Eurovision? Oh, I think I think there's there's so many, obviously, and you go back through the years, you know, there's been so, so many great, great performances. Um, I think probably two of the, the 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 ones that would stand out would be Euphoria from Sweden that year, because it really just, I think, took 
every so often, Eurovision is not entirely in with popular music all the time, although more and more so in recent years. But at the same time, it really brought it into mainstream, you know, at that. I think it was a powerful performance. And the Danish um, song, Only Teardrops, again, going around in our bare feet at that time, just really, I think, grabbed people in terms of just the song, the performance, the way she held the stage, everything. It was it was really, really particularly. And, and there have been so many good ones. But for me, it is about a singer being able to really feel that the audience feel, I connect with this person, I get what they're singing, and, and I'm in the performance all of a sudden. That makes all the difference. Thanks, Johnny. Um, so I'm now going to pass back to Adrian, who's going to speak with Rebecca. Just a reminder um, that you can ask questions to write. Um, we might get to a few of them later on, but if there's any relevant now, we'll also ask them too. So thanks, Adrian. Uh, thanks, Keelan. And just a reminder as well, if you have any favourite winners from Eurovision, please let us know. Uh, Dermot there has just noted... Uh, Dermot has noted that his favourite winner is Monaco's winner from the 1971 contest, the first contest that was held in Ireland in the Gaiety Theatre. Uh, hopefully my Leaving Cert French will get this right. Un banc, un arbre, un rue. Um, sorry. Anyway, uh, so I'd like now, last but not least by any means, I'd like to introduce Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca is also based in Minute, and Rebecca is from the Federal Department. And Rebecca is one of the leading, if not the leading, minute Eurovision people. Uh, she's been to definitely a lot more Eurovisions than I have. I don't like one. crowds. One. <laughs> That's more than I have. I don't like crowds. Rebecca, uh, would you like to talk about your experience of going to Eurovision, actually? Uh, what year it was and what was it, what was it like? How long do you have, Adrian? Um, yeah, um, um, for me going I went in 2018 great year went to Lisbon obviously we had um, Nathan's favorite song so we had we had Ryan and um, it was I was always so special like I always wanted to go to the Eurovision to go to a Eurovision where we qualified out of our semi-final we were in the final and we also had a really good emotive song and um, we had a song that the audience loved and um, that was just that was really special like I had my Lars moment, like Lars from Fire Saga walking in to um, the Alti Stadium in Lisbon. And I was like, am I really here? Like that's what Michael was saying about preparing Brooke for walking into the stadium. I walked in to the show. I wasn't performing, but it was just for me. I was like, oh, my goodness, like I'm home. It was just like it was a really special moment. Um, and the fact that we had a good song um, and it was really emotive, even when we were walking through Lisbon, people were coming up to us and they were interpretive dancing with us. And it was just, it was really, really special to, to go to the Eurovision. We actually didn't go to the, um, we couldn't get tickets for the grand final. So we went to the, like the final dress rehearsal, the family show as they call it, which if anyone is thinking of going to the Eurovision, try and get tickets for that show because it's really polished. They've, very little to iron out at the end of the day. And then you get to hot footed to the Eurovision village and watch the Eurovision on the screen, you know, in the host country with, with your tribe, with all your super fans. So that was something that was really, really special for me back in 2018. Also, it was the year that Netta won, which was a great song. But um, then there ended my um, trips to the Eurovision because I wasn't going to go to Israel. Uh, you're... Favorite Eurovision, apart from attending, uh, what would would you would your favorite Eurovision uh, song or entry have been, Rebecca? Just to note, we've had uh, comments from Imaina from Croatia. She said it's hard to pick up one favorite entry, but she said Non Holeta and Vola are some of her favorites. Very very different eras there. Very interesting. Nathan's back again to say his favorite winner was Duncan Lawrence's Arcade from 2019. Oh, yeah. Uh, how about yourself? Like asking my favorite Eurovision song is like asking someone to choose their favorite mm. child. Like, I, I, I have very, um, I have a very eclectic taste. Um, I really liked 2013 Turkey, um, which I think might actually be the the song that Keelan was referring to. Um, you know, every way that I am, um, or every way that I can, I really like that song. Ruslana, um, her wild dances for the performance, for everything. Everything the Ukraine does, Eurovision, I just think they really nail it. Um, 
I'm a big fan of the of Barefoot um, winners like Loreen Euphoria, huge song, still listen to it um, probably weekly. Um, and then um, Only Teardrops again, as as Johnny said. Yeah, they, they were both uh, barefoot um, winners, which I think there might be something there. Um, obviously, back to the Sandy Show as well. Good song there. Um, my, my taste is eclectic, as you'll see when we come to the, the final section where we go through the songs for this year. Um, I either like it to be penned by the... Um, penned by the performer. I think that really gives something very special and really emotive. Or I like it to be like a big song or like an earworm, you know, something that you really just like, I'm not going to lie. I've listened to Moldova 168 times to date. I, I, yeah, it's not going to go anywhere, but it's going on my Spotify playlist. I love it. I really like that kind of folksy and um, like, you know, I wasn't opposed to Yeah Yeah Ding Dong in uh, Fire Saga. So I like that kind of German folksy kind of um, pop. So my taste is eclectic. Um, but my favorite Eurovision song, probably Lorraine Euphoria. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. And that brings us thanks, up Adrian. literally to the 10 o'clock mark, and we're doing very well on time. So as I said, uh, there's plenty of scope for everyone to join in today. Uh, as like last year with the big panel, a lot of the questions it was really rushed. So hopefully this year, as Dermot and Mina and Nathan have been doing, you can join in, type in the comments if you have any comments of that. But we're actually going to kind of the more, moving on to the more formal academic content here today. So I'm going to try and share the screen here. Uh, Nessa, by the way, just before I move on, Nessa said, uh, there's some quick ones coming in now. Nessa said, first Eurovision memory for me, 1981, Eurovision, where they did skirt rip and key change, uh, books phase, making your mind up, brilliant. Great moment and a catchy song. Thanks, Nessa. Catherine uh, said, rock and roll kids, still my favorite memory. Uh, oh, Keelan said, we can see that perfectly. Excellent. So uh, I'm going to say a few boring points about various things about Eurovision voting, uh, what I think about things like uh, the jury vote, the televote. Um, what I think about the importance of language, or I think uh, comments on the importance of running order. So I'll try and keep it fairly snappy, but uh, if I'm waffling, uh, Keelan is allowed to go in the chat and tell me to stop waffling. Uh, just to remind everyone again, this is part of the of Geo Night. It's in the morning. This is Ireland. We don't think do things well. To be honest, Geo Night's too late for me. I'm usually in bed by nine o'clock, so. I have to do in the morning. Sorry about that. Uh, Orla's just said about Norway's fairy tale. I just see that in the chat. Uh, one of my favorites and first memories of Eurovision as the final was on the same day I made my communion. Brilliant. Thanks, Orla. Okay, moving on. So, tonight, uh, so here's the comments. Uh, uh, and again, just to note, this conference today is organized through the Minuto University Social Sciences Institute. Now, uh, the first map there is a map I drew up literally in the last few days. It's a bit basic, so apologies for that. Uh, uh, this is a map of the most successful countries in Eurovision uh, between 1956 and 1997. 1997 is an interesting year. It's the year when, it's the year when televoting was introduced, but a lot, of diff a lot of things were happening in the late 1990s, early 2000s in Eurovision, and it wasn't just they changed the televoting. So as you can see, the most successful countries, uh, the way I've calculated this, it's not just on wins, it's based on the number of times the country was in the top three, in the top five, top 10. And then we, when you get to the semifinals, uh, it's based on the number of times a country qualifies out of semifinal, but you also lose marks or points if you qualify in the semifinal, or if you finish in the bottom five. So, Funnily enough, the most successful country in Eurovision, uh, according to my metric, was the United Kingdom, because they may not have won as many times as Ireland, uh, unless I'm mistaken, and Eurovision nerds can correct me, Euro UK won it five times, I think. But the UK finished second and third quite a lot of times, I think around 21 times in total. So uh, United Kingdom, slightly ahead of Ireland, United Kingdom, Ireland, France, also very strong, France very strong, particularly in the 50s and 60s. Well, let's see what changed in the 2000s. If you look at the map, 
it's almost like a shift to the east, with the exception of Sweden and Norway, uh, both Sweden and Norway probably doing even better in the current era than they did on average than they did in uh, the earlier era. But the big shift, uh, the really strong superpowers in Eurovision in the 2000s, uh, no longer Ireland, UK, France, uh, the most successful country on my metric uh, Ukraine slightly ahead of Russia, uh, other really successful countries in this period, along with Sweden and Italy, uh, Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Turkey no longer take part, and also uh, countries like Serbia, Greece, and Armenia. Um, so what's happened? Uh, the stereotype of what ha what's happened is, oh, the big change is Eastern European countries came in and they all started voting for each other, blah, 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 and in 2008, the stereotype no, was no Western country would ever win again. But of course, in the last 10 years, we've seen 10 or 15 years, we've seen countries like Finland, Austria, Portugal. Uh, we've probably seen as many, well, actually probably more winners from Western Europe in the last 10 years than from the east of the continent or east of Eurovision land. So the stereotypes don't always back up. Um, so I'm going to look at this as a geographer or an electoral geographer, and different things matter to electoral geographers, different things matter also in Eurovision. Candidate selection. We talk about that in electoral geography, but also applies to Eurovision, the way you select your act, the way you select your uh, song. Do you have an open final? Uh, do you uh, have an internal selection? Countries sometimes use the same method all the time. So Sweden, for instance, has a huge uh, selection process. They've uh, four big semi-finals, a kind of uh, a, a second chance contest, and then they've uh, the final. Uh, other countries may decide to go down the internal selection route. Campaigning matters. So do you campaign? There is a campaign you can get involved. You, we talked about this with Michael at the start, the pre-party. So do you, do you attend the Eurovision pre-parties? Uh, some countries actually go to other Eurovision countries and their act performs there, in addition to the pre-parties. Is there a majority to the voting? Uh, is there a majority to the televote, the public vote? Friends and neighbours voting, does that exist? It does. Diaspora voting, does that exist? But is it political? Um, I'll talk about that. Voting rules matter. Running order matters. Uh, language matters. And last but not least, I probably won't get into this, but Michael and Johnny and Rebecca and Keelan touched on this already, and they may get back to this in the discussion afterwards. Uh, Eurovision matters, but why? Why does it matter to countries, uh, and particularly for some countries? Uh, looking at voting patterns, so uh, voting patterns trends have changed quite a bit since the birth of Eurovision in 1956. 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, this contest was dominated by French language ballads, chansons. Then we had a shift towards uh, slagger, more pop entries. So you had your uh, Making Your Mind Up winning, Diggy Lou, Diggy Lee, uh, Bobby Sox winning in the 80s. And then the uh, 1990s dominated by Celtic ballads, ethnic pop dominating in the 2000s. The present era is more of an anti goal. So there's a lot of variety in terms of who wins Eurovision. Changes in the voting rules, I'll come to this later, I'll skip over this for now, but changes in how we, how the voting takes place. Uh, well, actually, I, I don't, so in the past we had up to the late 90s, all voting was done by juries. In the 2000s, with some exceptions, all voting was done by the public. At present, in the last, uh, 10, 15 years or so, we've had the combination, we have a combination of jury voting and public voting. Up to 2015, jury ranks and televote ranks for different countries were combined to give a one set of points for each country. Since 2016, each country submits two set of points, a jury vote ranking set of points and a public vote ranking set of points. Changes in the membership of the contest, uh, the contest uh, was largely only open to Western European countries, or only Western European countries took part with the exception of countries like Greece, Cyprus, Turkey, and Yugoslavia. 
more or less up to the 1990s, but the contest opened up dramatically in the 1990s and the 2000s. And one of the biggest changes was the introduction of the semi-final system in 2004, which meant as many countries as possible, I think up until the magic number is 45. I could be right, Michael will probably correct me on this, but in 2004, the contest, the rules of the contest was changed. So it meant each country could take part every year. And that meant most years now, you have around 40, 41 or so countries taking part each year. And that change in the memberships had a big impact, not just in terms of voting, but also in terms of the different styles of music that comes to the contest. Uh, comes in language. Uh, Eurovision uh, countries, we had for much of the history of Eurovision up to the late 90s, with the exception of the 1970s, uh, countries generally tended to perform in their native language. A formal native language rule, I think, didn't actually come in until the mid 60s. Up to the, in the first 10 years, countries were performing in their native language, but a formal rule came in the mid 60s. And that rule more or less stayed in place until 1999, with the exception of the mid 70s, where you had winners like uh, uh, ABBA, as uh, Waterloo won in that period. Uh, and of the Netherlands had their last win before Arcade, also in that period, also with uh, an English language song. The relaxation of this native language rule came in in 1999, and it meant that a lot of countries from 1999 onwards were starting to opt to perform in English because they looked at the trends. The trends in the 1990s was the most successful countries in Eurovision tend to be those countries that performed in English. Uh, Ireland won a lot of times in the 1990s, the UK won in 1997. Malta had a good run of top 10 finishes also in the 1990s. 1999, that kind of English advantage that Malta, Ireland and UK had was lost because every other country could perform in English if they wanted to. And a lot of countries in the 1990s and sorry, in the 2000s, and especially around 2015, 2016, were opting to perform in English because there was a sense that you had a much better chance of qualifying from a semi-final if your song was in English, you had a much better chance of winning Eurovision if your song was in English. So between uh, 1999 and 20, 2016, only one entry in that period was performed uh, almost totally in the native language. So, uh, that was Molotva, Serbia's winner in 2007. Ukraine's two winners were part English, part Ukrainian 2004, part English, part Crimean 2016. But, but things started to change over the last few years. Uh, the big change probably was Portugal, Salvador Sobral winning in 2017, well, that song in the Portuguese language. And of course, last year's Eurovision was very interesting where you saw four of the five top 10 finishers where songs are performed in native languages, languages other than English. Iceland was the only English language song in the top five. Uh, the majority to uh, the use of English are countries that don't use English. Uh, the countries that are least likely to use English, that are most likely to rely on their native language, tend to be most located in the south of the continent. continent. So the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, Serbia, and also the Balkan region, but particularly countries like uh, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Montenegro, and also a shout out there to Croatia, Albania, North Macedonia, and Slovenia, and Bulgaria as well. Um, the former Soviet states have generally tend to send entries that are in English or partly in English. That's generally been the trend. Estonia, probably the, the country most likely out of the former Soviet states uh, to send acts that are solely in Estonian. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at Ukraine, and this might be something that could be picked up on in the discussion, the last three Ukrainian entries have all been in Ukrainian. Uh, prior to that, all the Ukrainian entries were in English or as in 2004-2016, part English, part Ukrainian, part English, part, uh, part English, part Crimean. So language um, of the I can't actually see the number there. You can, at the 886 countries have taken part, entries have taken part in Eurovision since 1999. Only 22% of them roughly have been 
solely in the native language other languages other than English. The most popular languages outside of English at uh, Eurovision have been French, Spanish, Portuguese, Hebrew, Serbian, Croatian, Greek, Macedonian, and Slovene. Up to this year, only three entries, three winners, three winning entries have involved no use of English, but this includes two of the last four winners, uh, Italy last year, Portugal 2017. This year, I might be wrong, I'm, my estimate at the moment is 11 acts this year have entries that are solely in the native language other than English. Uh, and this, this marks a turnaround in the trend. The trend in the 2000s, early 2010s was a greater use of English. The trend over the last few years has seen countries starting to use their native language more and more. And we see this year 11 acts. Back in 2016, that number was three and only one there was only one act in the 2016 final uh, that was not in English or partly in English, that was Austria's Long de Sea by Zoe, which was actually in French. Fun fact. Eurovision voting patterns. Now, I'll see how we are in time. I won't try and overlabor this. Uh, voting patterns, I'm going to talk about televote patterns. Uh, there's two trends I want you to pick up. I'll talk about them on the maps. Uh, the trends to look, up, look at are the friends and neighbors effect, where you win a lot of televote points from countries in the same region as you, a diaspora effect, where you win a lot of points because you win a lot of points because you have countries, uh, you, you have a large immigrant population in other countries across Europe, other Eurovision countries. All I'd say is, as especially as a trend over the last few years of Joan, if you're going to win Eurovision, you're not going to win Eurovision just because you're getting a large number of votes from your friends and neighbors or a large diaspora vote. Victory still depends on being able to win votes from countries all over Eurovision land. Here's a few maps to show you. Uh, Ukraine, you're seeing uh, a big vote for Ukraine in their neighborhood, particularly from the for former Soviet states, but also neighboring Poland but also some big votes for Ukraine outside of their region, Italy and Iberia, possibly reflecting diaspora trends. People who know, uh, who are more aware of the Ukrainian diaspora will correct me on this. Uh, Armenia as well, you're also seeing uh, a former Soviet block vote for Armenia, but not up in the Baltic region. Uh, the three Baltic states now have great vote there for Armenia. Um, looking outside of that, you can see the impact of the Armenian diaspora um, over in the West of Europe, the big Armenian diaspora in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Okay, the next map, I'll actually throw this open to you. What do you, what do you think, and throw your answers into the chat. So this is Serbia. I'm going to show you Serbia or Slovenia and Croatia. So what do you notice in the trends in those maps? What are you seeing in those maps? So I'll give you two minutes to look at, the, think about those maps and there's Croatia there and see what you come up with. Okay, uh, so looking at the maps there, uh, just to see any comments there, uh, anything popping up, sorry, can't fully see the comments, so if I'm missing any, I'll definitely try and, or Keelan or I will get back to them. So you are seeing Serbia, Slovenia and Croatia, big votes for them, there is a diaspora vote, but you're seeing big votes for these countries in the former Yugoslav states. 
And that's interesting. You see the same trend, as I said, with Armenia and Ukraine, a trend where countries that were once part of the same country, uh, these would have been countries that were part of Yugoslavia up until the early 1990s, the same with Armenia and Ukraine being part of the former Soviet Union. Countries that are part of the same country. Uh, they may have been, they're obviously all independent states now. Uh, in some cases, there was conflict between these countries. But the one thing these countries have is this kind of common history. But another thing, I'd be interested to hear any of our uh, participants from Croatia or Slovenia, if they're here today, if they've got any comments on this. You're seeing a, a diaspora vote, but you're also seeing probably country people voting for con neighboring countries in the region, voting for Croatia or Slovenia or Bosnia, Herzegovina or North Macedonia or Montenegro or Serbia on the basis that the style of music appeals to people from the same region. And also on the basis that the acts that countries send, people are aware of them. Uh, people in Ireland probably won't have heard of the act that Croatia is sending this year or the act Serbia is sending, but people in Croatia or Slovenia or North Macedonia may, may be aware, know of the acts from the other neighboring countries. So, you look at those maps and the kind of consensus you might get there is countries in Eastern Europe uh, are tending to get a lot of votes from their neighbours. It's the same with countries in Western Europe. You see Sweden here, uh, a fairly okay vote across Europe, but a big vote particularly in their backyard in the Viking bloc region. Uh, the same with Denmark to not as strong as uh, Sweden, but also a still a very notable Jorvi there, again focus on the Viking bloc region, which includes Scandinavia and Iceland. And Iceland, there's a very strong vote there for Denmark. But also the Viking bloc country also includes uh, sometimes the Baltic states, the three Baltic states. They seem to have a foot in the Viking bloc, but also the former Soviet bloc. But it also includes Ireland and the United Kingdom as well. And probably could also, as the next map suggests, uh, this is Germany, so you see a similar Georgia there, but a big vote for Germany also in the Iberian Peninsula, but this is Australia. Uh, Australia's map, voting map, is very similar to Sweden's, very similar to Denmark's. It's almost like a typical Viking bloc voting map. Uh, it's almost like a reverse friends and neighbours effect. It's the part of Europe that's furthest away from Australia, but the key thing really is not geographical distance, some, sometimes it's cultural difference, it's cultural similarities. And I think that's probably what comes out with Australia there. Uh, just going back to uh, Croatia and Slovenia, the maps there, I'll just pop back to those because the miners making a good point there. Uh, she says, Look, it looks like Croatia and Slovenia are the ones struggling to get votes from outside of the ex-Yugoslavian countries. We vote for each other, though, because Serbian artists are popular in Croatia and vice versa. So thanks, Emina, for that. And hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, Ireland, we have a majority voting too. Uh, our majority voting is interesting. It's not necessarily Jorvi. Our best friend in your vision in terms of where we get points, Jorvi is obviously evident there, the United Kingdom. Our next best friend is Denmark. But, in terms of Jorvi, we'd probably expect to be doing fairly well from France. It's not a million miles away from us, but we struggle to win points from France. We also struggle to win points from Italy. Uh, we're, as the map would suggest, we're more likely to go win points at Eurovision from Azerbaijan or have been over the last 20 years or so than we have been to win points from Italy or France. Uh, so our map is, it's kind of a, a reduced Viking block map, again, like Sweden, like Australia, like Denmark, we tend to win our points from the Viking bloc countries, uh, the Nordic countries, United Kingdom, but also the three Baltic states as well. We do fairly well from them as well, with some shout outs as well to countries like Belgium and Switzerland. Thanks for the, the points. Uh, I think you're picking up Hungary there as well. That's big Hungary points votes there, are relatively big Hungary votes. That was uh, 10 points for Donna and Joe McCall at the 2015, sorry, 2005 semi-final. 
So the televote and jury voting, the perception of, that a lot of people will have is that the televote is political, the jury vote is totally unbiased, it's professional. The reality is, I think it's not that clear. I think, is there a politics with uh, the televote? Maybe sometimes, I think there's probably obvious politics if you look if you look back at the map of Armenia and saw the fact they don't win points from next door Azerbaijan and vice versa. But I would argue that when people vote for countries, when people vote for the next door neighbors, it's not because they like the politics. Uh, there might be some political uh, linkages, say, between countries like Greece and Cyprus. But a lot of it has to do with culture, cultural tastes, cultural similarities, but also as Emina said, uh, the fact that you're aware of acts from the neighboring countries. Ireland's probably more likely to vote for the UK than for uh, countries in Eastern Europe because we're, there's a good chance we might have heard of the UK Act before the contest. So what shapes the televote? I think cultural similarities, the fact that people from different regions like different types of music, and that's good. Uh, are there biases and politics associated with jury voting? Is the jury voting totally unbiased? Um, I'm not too sure about that. I think sometimes you get a better idea of the political relationships between countries by looking at a country's jury vote than you do from uh, looking at the televote. Sometimes the televotes of neighboring countries, even if countries are on bad relationships, sometimes because of the music similarities or sometimes because of simple diaspora factors, Sometimes you tend to find that there's still votes being, votes are still transferred between these countries when it comes to the televote. But when, the, when you get the jury vote, sometimes you do see the politics there. Um, there's a lot of examples of these. I won't over elaborate on this. I'll actually just look at the Russia, Russia's vote for Ukraine and Ukraine's vote for Russia in the 2016 final, which you might remember that was the year Jamala won. Uh, Jamala won uh, the contest, which actually finished second, I think, in both the tally vote and the jury vote. Uh, Russia won the tally vote, but didn't win the jury vote. Uh, so both Russia, Sergei Lazarev, both Jamala did very well. Uh, and we could look at Armenia and Azerbaijan. I've talked about that before, Dermot. Armenia and Azerbaijan, if you look at their juries uh, and tally votes, uh, if you look at their juries, uh, Armenia always rank Azerbaijan last, usually each jury member does, and vice versa. With, I've picked up one notable exception in the last few years. But going back to Russia and Ukraine here, um, uh, 2016 final, remember Jamala won, uh, Jamala was second in the jury vote. Uh, the Russian public actually ranked Jamala as the second best or second favorite act in the 2016 final, but the Russian jury ranked Jamala in 24th place, uh, second last, which is kind of, it's, considering this was one of the, there's all, you have to get, you probably get a sense that, okay, is this totally a music? Uh, but let's look at Russia in that 2016 final. Let's look at how you, the way Ukraine ranked Russia. Uh, Sergei Lazarev, uh, 2016, and this is a few years after, uh, the conflicts in Eastern Ukraine and Crimea started off. Uh, the public in Ukraine ranked Sergei Lazarev. The televote had Russia first. Russia got 12 points from the Ukrainian televote, but the Ukrainian jury ranked Russia in 22nd place. Uh, there's a lot of examples there about Russia in the next few slides. I, make, I won't go into too much detail, but you'll see from the slides, there's a sense that the televoting, you're not getting a sense of the, the televote for Russia from neighboring countries. This is Sergei Lazarev's second coming in 2019, uh, his song Scream, which also finished third. Uh, if you look at that 2019 televote, Ukraine didn't take part in 2019, but nearly all the former Soviet states, uh, with the exception of Georgia, and Georgia, Russia still did very well in the televote. All the neighboring former Soviet states, uh, Sergei Lazarev was the top ranked act. He got 12 points from all the neighbors. Uh, when you look at the jury vote, however, it's a big drop with the exception of Azerbaijan. Uh, generally, it's a case of winning fewer points or no points in the case of Georgia from uh, the neighboring countries in the jury vote. 
Uh, so jury voting, tele voting, um, are the Israel politics to the tele vote more so than jury votes? I'm not convinced. I would probably argue the relationship's more likely to go the other way around. Okay, um, last point, and I'm really over egging the cake here, so I want to hand back to Keelan and the panel very quick, but I'm just going to say a few points about contest running order. It's one of my pet topics. Uh, I love crunching the numbers on the running order. So does the contest running order matter? Uh, I say, yes, it does. Uh, the usual rule in thumb is the later you are on in a semi-final or final, the better your chances of doing well, particularly with the televote. Um, Things have been kind of a bit, things are, have been a bit more complicated in recent years, since 2013, because up to 2013, we had a draw and the position you got in the semi-final running order or the final running order, depending on what draw position you got. So it was pretty transparent. It did lead to a problem, as we saw the year Jedward did very well in 20, 2011. It did lead to occasional problems where you might have a lot of up-tempo acts all in the same running order, part of the running order. So that year, I remember Hungary, Ireland, Sweden, Estonia were all after each other and they're all up-tempo songs and probably some of the songs lost out as a result. So from 2013, it's been decided that the show producers should be deciding the running orders. Um, um, now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? The, the argument for this is it helps in certain ways. It helps avoid a lot of ballads being joined together in the same section of the running order. Um, it's um, also, it's also, they say that it avoids that, they say it allows songs to stand out. Uh, does it allow songs to stand out or not? It's open to the beach. Uh, I noticed that you can say we're putting this song in second place because it's going to stand out because you're an up-tempo act in first place in the running order and an up-tempo act in third place. But still, the songs that end up in second place in the running order in the Eurovision final, uh, that is the draw of debt or the running order position of debt in the Eurovision final. No country has won Eurovision from second. And in terms of the average number of points, it's the worst position you can get in the final. If you look at every year since 2013, uh, the best position a country has ended up in from performing in second place, I think it was Belarus and in 2014 in Denmark, uh, TO finished uh, in 16th place. So that's the best position in the last number of Eurovisions. Uh, Albania, I'll comment on. Albania got that number two slot in the Eurovision final in the last two contests. And uh, I don't know. I don't think that's that I don't think that's right to me. Anyway, best positions to get in the running order in the final. Uh, any position between 17th in the second half of the of the final, between 17th and 24th. Uh, the last two positions, it can be a bit dodgy for some acts because it's a very long final with 26 acts. This year it'll be 25, so it might change things. And sometimes people have already made up their mind by the time you get to the third last song, which was Italy in last year's contest. And if you're on last, it's just too late. People have started to switch off. The tea's been made. They're getting ready for the voting at that stage. Since the producer running orders were brought in, the positions between 10th and 13th in the first half have also you start to see countries doing well in those sections. So Austria, one from this position in the running order. Uh, Portugal, uh, one from this position. Sweden, run from this position in the running order. Uh, Amina says entries with later positions in the running order fare better on an advantage because the producers tend to put favorites in those later positions. And yeah, I would, uh, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, a lot of times, if a song, so what happens in the semi final or the final nowadays is you do have a draw to decide whether you're first in the first half of the semi-final or the second half or the first half of the final or the second half. Uh, the only exception is the host country gets, their position is drawn uh, at random. So Italy this year, we already know will be ninth in ninth position in the running order. Uh, the show producers then decide the running order for the countries in the first half of the final of the countries in the second half. 
So it means if you're between 10th and 13th, you're in the later part of the first half. So a lot of the favorites in the first half often tend to end up in that section. Although Malta last year uh, ended up in sixth place in the rooming order when they were drawn uh, to perform in the first half. So the worst position to get in the final is number two in the rooming order. Anywhere between second, third or fourth is pretty bad, usually on average. And the second half, if you end up in the second half of the running order, positions 14 to 15 are usually quite bad to get. Best position in the running order in the semi-final last is brilliant. 90% uh, ish of the countries that have performed from last position in the semi-final running order have gone on to get to uh, the final. They've gone on to qualify. Last year, Denmark missed out on the final, but they would have actually qualified for the final if it had been solely based on the televote. So Denmark performed last last year, they missed out, but it was because of a low jury vote. If it had been based solely on the televote, they would have been in the final. Second last is the next best position. Worst position in the running order in the semifinals in the first half, anywhere between second and fifth. Statistically, third position is the worst position in the semifinal. Uh, in the second half of the draw, anywhere between 10th and 11th. Uh, this year, Ireland will be in 10th place, in our running order. So we were drawn to perform in the second half of the semi-final. I was hoping we'd get last position because it's an up-tempo act and the producers usually put an up-tempo act last in the semi-final running order in the final running order, but no, uh, Czech Republic got last. We actually got put on at the very start of the second half. So that's not good news for us as Dermot uh, noted there. He said 10th in the running order for our semi-final this year, terrific. I'm not sure if Dermot's, I think, uh, in terms of where we could have ended up, because as I said, we're drawn to perform in the second half of the semi-final. We could have ended anywhere between 10th and 18th. The positions we didn't want to get were 10th or 11th. Uh, Croatia, uh, Amina will, has uh, actually a slide about this later on. Croatia has ended up in 11th place in their semi-final, and they tend to end up in 10th or 11th place in the semi-finals quite a bit. Uh, there's some wonderful statistics on semi-final qualification rates from the different running order positions. So hopefully you'll pick out there that third is actually statistically the worst position to get. Uh, second, fourth, fifth, not great. But the later you perform in the running order, uh, your chances get better and better, with the exception of that little gap around 10th or 11th position in the running order, which I think is because these are countries that are at the start of the second half of the best position, last position in the running order. This year, what does that mean? The countries are winning this year, Armenia, semi-final one, and Norway, two, and Norway, Czech Republic, semi-final two, and Sweden. So they're in the sweet spots in terms of the running order. Worst positions, uh, Serbia, semi-final two, Israel and Azerbaijan, semi-final two, and also Ireland, North Macedonia in the second half. Lithuania, semi-final one, also Latvia and Switzerland, and also Portugal and Croatia in the first semi-final. The running order in the final, as I said, uh, there's a graph there that shows that. 18th position, funnily enough, is not a bad one to get. 17th is not a bad one to get. 18th, statistically, if you leave outside the other stats, a lot of songs entries do quite well in 18th position. On average, that's the average number of points. Worst position to get in the final, you'll see, hopefully see from the graph, it's the second position. It's a terrible position to get in the running order. And it's not got any better in the last few contests. As you'll see from there, uh, best position statistically you can get, um, third last position in the running order. And as the contest goes on, the later the contest goes on, the better your chances of doing well, of picking up points. There is a slight difference over the last few years because of the producer-led running orders, uh, if you end up in 10th, 11th, 12th, or 13th position, there's a chance you're going to do well. But maybe because of this tendency, as Amina said in the chat, this tendency to uh, put favorites who are drawn to perform in the first half of the final, a tendency to put the favorites in that section of the running order. Uh, second last chart, I promise, uh, this shows the impact of the televote and the impact of the jury vote in terms of running order. So hopefully you'll pick out from this that 
running order probably does, in fairness, have more of an impact on the televote, the public vote, because the public, by and large, probably just listen, if they're listening to the finalists, for a lot of the people, it's the first time they'll listen to the songs. You would imagine most jury members will have heard the songs a few times if they're doing their job, so they're probably less impacted by the running order. 2017 is interesting. You saw this big jump in terms of the number of points won by songs around in the last six, seven positions in running order, but also around positions eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now, this was a year Portugal won. Portugal performed in that slot. I think Portugal were 11th, I could be wrong. You also had Italy at ninth in this running order. Italy were the pre-contest favorites. So as I said, sometimes you tend to find a lot of the favorites who end up being drawn to perform in the first half of the show. A lot of times there's a tendency for them to end up in that kind of that sweet section in the first half of the running order. Uh, I'm going to finish off with this. Uh, thanks to Emina for this. This is looking at Croatia's uh, running order uh, slots over the last, since they returned to Eurovision in 2016 after a break of a few years. So uh, since 2017, Croatia has been drawn uh, to perform in the second half of the running order which would, should be on paper a really good thing, but they always seem to tend up to end up at the start of the running order. And this has probably had an impact on their results. So since Croatia came back, uh, 2016, they got to the final with Nina Krajic. I probably pronounced that wrong. 2017, they got a bad position in the second half running order, but Jack Kudek, a very kind of, I remember that quite well when he was singing with himself. Uh, uh, that got to the final as well. But the last few years, uh, we'll see what happens this year. Croatia failed to qualify. And a lot, of, a lot of their entries seem to end up in the same slot in the running order. And sometimes I do find that happens with the producer-led running orders. There's a tendency to kind of do the same thing again and again. Uh, uh, if you look at our semi-final this year, we're in the same position of the running order as Australia, North Macedonia, and Cyprus. And last year, we were in the same position in the running order as Australia, Cyprus, and North Macedonia. And last of all, just to shout out to anyone listening in from Albania. Albania, as I said, as I've said already, running order positions, worst position you can get is number two in the final running order. The last two Eurovision finals, Albania has got the number two slot in both of those contests. Okay, everyone. Uh, Thanks for listening to that. Hopefully it wasn't too boring. I'll try and unshare now. Oh, I think I'll be unshared. Uh, so before I hand back to Keelan, uh, I'll just see there was one other comment not necessarily related to uh, the voting. Uh, Aoife said, uh, sorry for missing out this earlier, Aoife. Uh, it was relating to our earlier discussion. I loved everything about Eurovision 2015, watching it with my friends while we were simul simultaneously celebrating the results of the marriage equality referendum it was a fun night. Okay, I've talked enough folks. I need to drink a lot of water now. So I'm going to hand over to Keelan and she's going to lead the panel and yourselves in the discussion about anything relating to these, what I've talked about in the last few minutes or any other things relating to Eurovision and politics. So I'm shutting up and I'm Enjoy your water, Adrian, and thanks for sharing that. So I'm going to bring back all three panellists, so Rebecca, Johnny and Michael, just for a little discussion on uh, different things picked up from Adrian's uh, presentation. Um, so if you do have any questions, which there have been a few coming in, please get asking. And um, yeah, so um, if Johnny, uh, Rebecca and Michael could join if that's okay and we'll get started now a few of the questions will actually leave until the um the jukebox jury i think because i think a lot is actually relevant including um things on ukraine's success and their change of uh kind of style when it comes to the eurovision i think that will come in uh to the jukebox jury because they are one of the favorites this year to win but i do want to start first of all with the voting system so um i suppose um, Michael, I'll start with you with regards to the voting system, since you've experience of um, going to the Eurovision and doing the like, um, experience of the voting systems and different voting systems. How have you felt that that has impacted countries at the Eurovision? Do you think it's fair or do you think there's room for improvement? 
Um, it, it's a bit like the leaving search, you know, it's probably the best system we have, that, but it's still unfair, but it's probably the best system we have. I mean, the, uh, the, you know, the attraction of the public vote, I think, is, is one that certainly increases the viewer engagement in it. You know, if you feel you have a stake, if you're allowed vote, you can, you know, you, you feel like you have some sort of um, uh, say in, in the outcome of it. Um, the jury thing, I mean, uh, like the, the I was in, very interested in, in uh, Adrian's um, discourse there about uh, jury voting and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> there's no doubt about it. Um, jury voting, is, it can be unfair and it can be biased and it can be, um, I don't know if I go so far as to say corrupt, but you know, I, I, I think certainly in the past, there have been instances of that. And you could argue that, you know, when you, when you look at certain countries, the way they, um, Dermot mentioned it there in one, of the, in one of the comments, the way they exchange votes with their neighbors consistently are alternatively gives null point to their neighbors consistently, um, I think needs to be looked at. I don't know how you counteract that, you know what I mean? Um, all I can do is speak for my own experience in terms of assembling jurors for the Irish um, Eurovision, uh, you know, jury here. And like, we're, I, th I think we're scrupulously fair. I think the jurors are scrupulously fair. I mean, they have inherent biases, as you know. I mean, everybody on the jury is gonna have an inherent biases one way or the other, but um, but it's as fair, I think, as we, we, as we can make it, you know? Um, so that's really what I, I want to say. I think it's probably the, the, the voting system is probably the best system that we can come up with that ticks the most boxes for people. Thanks, Michael. Um, and there was actually a question about uh, when you mentioned the corruption, there was a question there about them. So thanks for answering that. Uh, John asked that question. Um, and then when it comes to uh, voting patterns as well, obviously friends and neighbours, like people voting for their neighbours, do you think that is... Um, so because people have previously had gripes about people voting for their neighbours. Do you think this is an issue, um, uh, Johnny, with regards to the Eurovision Song Contest? I think I, I think it's an issue that exists more in people's minds, you know, uh, about the, the, the gripes in it. And I think people get obsessed with it, you know. Um, the critical thing that that often missed with your vision, I, I, funny enough, the people who give out most about the countries that vote for each other and the friends and neighbours and whether our country is voting for that, their neighbour, things they'd see like that, are usually people that will follow that up quickly with, that's why I hate your vision and I don't watch it anymore and they're no longer interested and they give you this, this spiel about it. The truth is, uh, when you look at your vision, you know, Again, there's a difference between there's a lot of countries that just want to take part. We're just happy to be there. There are a lot of countries whose aim is, uh, well, if we just qualified and we just got to be part of the final, wouldn't that be wonderful? And then there are countries that take this really seriously and want to win it. Um, and the differences between those is the ones that are just happy to, to be there, to, to look, they go there, they don't pass much heed on what they, they want to get. It's the countries that are in that zone where, oh, all we want to do is qualify. They're the ones that get really het up about these voting patterns because it does make a difference if you're only aiming to qualify. Now, as Adrian pointed out, to win the contest, you need your friends and neighbours to vote for you and you need everybody else to vote for you as well. You have to pick up votes everywhere. The winning song does not win on friends and neighbors. It picks up votes everywhere. However, you can sometimes get out of a semi-final just on the fact that you have a strong base and a strong group of people that vote for you all the time and you manage to get through if you have a half decent song at all. And sometimes there are good songs, relatively good songs that don't get out of the semi-final and they feel hard done by as a result. The truth is they were never contenders in the final anyway. Um, and the one thing I'd say about it is that what you notice is that a lot of countries who are at the top end of it are willing to take risks. And for all the people that tell you Eurovision doesn't matter or the votes don't matter, they're afraid to take risks because they're terrified if they come bottom of the table, people will all laugh at us and we'll be so ashamed of that. It's shocking. But yet taking a risk is the very thing that can make your song stand out and can give you an astounding victory, you know, coming out of nowhere by saying, listen, let's change it up. And if you get it wrong, there should be no shame in getting it wrong. There should be no shame in not getting out of a semi-final. You try different things, different years, until you actually get something you hit on. 
Um, but I think we obsess a little bit about those patterns more than they actually affect it. They certainly aren't aren't a big part of the winning song. Thanks, Johnny. And um, just a question, a personal question that I have, Rebecca, you might be able to answer. Um, the United Kingdom, they haven't done quite well the past couple of years. And I suppose when it comes to the argument of the friends and neighbours effect, their argument is Brexit sometimes has impacted their themselves in the Eurovision. Do you think this is the case or do you think there's other factors that might have contributed to the United Kingdom and the Eurovision and how well they're actually doing? I don't think they've had, their heart hasn't been in it in a long time for me. Um, I really just... Um, like Johnny said, there should be no there should be no shame in, you know, sending a song that, you know, you know, isn't necessarily going to, to do that well. Obviously, because they're always going to qualify, they really should put a little bit more effort into to giving us something a bit more. Um, this year's song, I'm I'm not a fan of. We'll, we'll we'll get to it later. Again, I think it just falls short. Um so like for years and years, I've always, when I was growing up, I watched um the Terry Wogan commentary. So we never listened to the Irish commentary and it was always Terry Wogan commentary. And there was always this, like, you know, we're getting, yeah, sorry, Michael. <laughs> Don't get me started on Martin. Tell Martin um, but, like said. <laughs> but um, you know, there's always this, you know, like preempt, we're going, we're going to get nothing, you know, like um, you know, Wyoming Nil Point from Ireland. That that was always the, the preempt. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily know, is it that kind of rival like, I I, I know we always get our 12 points back from them or majority of the time. Um, I think our production is better. What we send is better. Um, I think there's probably a better team. See, there you go, Michael's a better team behind our Irish songs um, that really want to um, want to send something better than, than the UK have sent. Like, you know, like, you know, what was it? Scooch back in whatever year. Um, you know, all aboard like Eurovision, like, airways are like I love the cheesy kitsch but like you know um Katrina and the waves that was that was probably their their best in a long time um I don't like they've been down the bottom for a long time so I don't necessarily think it's it's us not throwing the 12 points their way there's a lot of countries that aren't feeling it for them either yeah um I had a massive issue with last year's entry because I just didn't like it at all it was probably my least favorite but I won't get on that rant because I got on that yesterday <laughs> And Adrian was shook. <laughs> um, well, I, sorry, Kim, can I just pick up on one point that Johnny made just about taking risks, you know, and I think that's something that we have done, you know, it hasn't worked out necessarily um, in, in our favour too much. But like, I think one of the things we do is take risks with our staging every year, you know, I mean, we, we, we can't be accused of just going out there and doing the same old thing, you know, I mean, like last year, for instance, was one of the most complicated uh, stagings that I think has ever been attempted by certainly by an Irish um, uh, act in Eurovision and um, you know and in the past then like you know even with you know with Ryan O'Shaughnessy we've had a very um, innovative um, staging you know as well so uh, like uh, you know and anyway look my, my point really is that yeah it's not for the want of, of trying and I think the UK probably have gotten a little a little lazy in the fact that they're always in the final so they just think that you know they don't as Rebecca said really have to try very hard you know yeah and they don't <laughs> and they don't yeah I definitely think and I think with Rhino Shaughnessy it actually the risk it paid off like you know it's like like I think that's kind of um supporting Johnny's point like that yeah. you know if countries like yeah it's a risk it could fall you know it might not get what you wanted to but it does it like it does become a success like sure people are still talking about ryan's performance yeah yeah and one i mean that was done without like we don't have the marketing budget of you know country other countries like you know malta famously you know two years ago spent whatever it was seven hundred thousand euro marketing their act um all over europe and and uh you know trying to to um putting bets on it you know in various places to get it up the odds so other countries like that, that marketing budget is becoming so important um, in terms of promoting your act before you even get to uh, to Eurovision. You know, Maniskin, absolutely the same thing as well. They were marketed to within an inch of their lives before they got near Eurovision. Yeah, it's it's unreal the marketing now, but it's, yeah, I suppose it it begs the 
But I suppose it worked out for Moniskin. As, uh, like, you know, they did win, but it yeah. doesn't always work out as well, putting those high budgets and you kind of question, like, do you need the high budget all the time? I suppose your heart has to be in it coming from Rebecca. Well, it's it's the it's where the budget is spent that you don't necessarily see. You know what I mean? Because you you the, the budget might be spent, as I said, in, in the in the in the four weeks running up to your vision in countries that we wouldn't necessarily know how they're they're marketing their their acts there, you know. So uh, that's increasingly important. And also record labels being behind acts is really important as well. Like that if you have a, an act signed to an international record label, you have the benefit of their network to promote your act all over Europe in the in the weeks and months before Eurovision. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Johnny, I actually want to come back to you because I just want to get on to culture within the Eurovision Song Contest. Do you find culture is um, an important aspect um, within, like, for countries to perform at the Eurovision Song Contest? Yeah, to, to a degree. I mean, look, there's, there's, I suppose, different ways. It depends on, you know, everybody's definition of culture, of course, is, 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 is very different. Um, but I think it is part and parcel of, of what countries want to do. It's, it's a great way of identifying. There are very few ways you can wave a national flag, uh, very few events or places where you can see people waving national flags and get no undercurrent of any violence uh, in, in the background of that. Uh, and that's the harsh reality. Uh, you know, Eurovision is one of the few places countries come together with huge nationalist stick pride about it and then just enjoy it you know and and turn away from it and go ah we like the song didn't like the song and there's no real threat behind it and i think that's that's a wonderful thing in the modern age to be able to to do but I think culturally what it does for countries is, particularly smaller countries, it allows them really showcase something, it allows them get out there and be seen. And you can see why. I mean, bigger countries, there's a reason that big political leaders and everything else have over the decades wanted their country to win your vision. And people might laugh at it, but it is a way of placing your country. It's a way of being accepted by other countries, seen as part of all this. And I think it, it, it does weigh, weigh heavily for countries. And equally, going back to that risk piece, that's where the shame bit kicks in. It's always this, oh God, the mortification of no points or, oh, we got lost. All of Europe is laughing at us. They're not. It's forgotten the next day. People move on. They don't remember who got no point last year. It just becomes one of those. But we obsess about that a little bit too. So we have this pride of let's just do well and let's just... But the truth is, and, and and that's where Michael's right about Ireland sometimes in recent years, we have been taking risks. They haven't all worked out, but I think that's a process. If you look at some countries that are doing badly for a while and then they start to go through a golden period where they come up again it generally is about experimentation risk finding what works finding what doesn't work and that can take years in the modern eurovision to work through and finding what it is your own people identify with and what people outside in europe identify with but that means so many countries just want to play it safe it's just well let's just send something nice and simple that'll get through and won't shame us and we're afraid of that two ends of the spectrum thing we'll either win or lose that sounds scary thanks um catherine has uh, added in about the stage in here uh look at portugal's winner 2017 and that's percent yeah. mind for yeah. me it was so simple it, it was all about the music more so in the song it made you really focus on the song uh that performance um obviously big performances all are eye-catching and they can win too but i think that's one clear example of simple stage but also on Catherine's, so that Portugal, as far as I'm concerned, that was the highest votes ever amassed um, by, by any song. And just back on like Adrian's block voting and all that kind of thing, like Portugal only share a border with one country. You know, diaspora wise, they're, they're not very far and wide. Um, and still that was just a song that resonated with people. It was really emotive, really simple staging. So it doesn't have to, you know, block voting aside, because in that case, you know, it didn't apply. It was people just really, um, you know, felt the song, were really moved by it, simple stage. And, and that was just, yeah, that was for me, that was really special because I was the year after we were there, 2018, when, you know, the, the winner does the roundup. And it was just to hear that surrounded by people like you could hear a pin drop. It was just phenomenal. So I'd say it was amazing to experience Rebecca. I'd say it was class. But also, because uh, on 2018, obviously, it was Ryan's year. And on your simple stage in Michael, it was just like, I obviously, I don't know what, you know, what it cost, but it was it was simple. I'm sure it was an absolute pain to set up. But it just really, 
like it just captured the audience perfectly because I think when we saw the the video for the song people were really concerned they were like the song was made by the dancing and the bridge and all that kind of thing and I think people were concerned like a lot of songs you're like how is that going to translate to the stage but um the staging for for Ryan's song really was just it was just phenomenal because it just it evoked the same emotion in people that was evoked in in the video when they saw it first um, and I think that's for me that's key when what you what you evoke in people the first time they hear the song and um, you know be it in the, the the national stages or whatever that that should translate to the stage and um, same emotion but just maybe bigger well ju just on that I mean that was Ryan had a very very strong creative vision of how he wanted the thing to look and for me like when we get an artist who knows exactly what they want to do that's kind of the I, I, an ideal situation for me because th there's no um you know sort of room for ambiguity or ifs and buts or actually you, you know yourself or I'm happy to do whatever you want to do whatever somebody with a very very clear vision of themselves or very very clear you know sense of their own identity and what they want to do is stuff that really works in Eurovision as far as I'm concerned you know we've been looking in the last few years that we've 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 had artists that have had that very very strong sense of what they you know who they are what they're about and what they want to achieve you know and I think actually we've got that again this year you know we've got somebody who is a very very co confident performer which is huge advantage as well and somebody that connects very well with cameras and um you know and and has a very as I said good sense of her own her own identity you know yeah and um I was going to actually ask just before we end because uh but to go to the jukebox section but Michael like kind of adding on to what you were just saying Brooke and Ryan they're kind of in similar situations where they both have um a experience of a competition in the United Kingdom so they're used to live performances um and do you know, I suppose that, and I don't want to give too much away of the stage and around in this year, I'm not looking for the, yeah, the, the, yeah, but it, I mean, it, it has helped, I suppose, when you have somebody who knows, um, like they have that experience. And I know Adrian was talking about her placement and how it's not great, but we also do have a few things going for us this year, which is she has experience. I absolutely think it's a cracker of a song. Um, so I suppose there are those benefits. Um, do you think having a, somebody with that experience in the United Kingdom has helped with Ireland? I, I, do you know, I think it helps them more when it comes to a Euro song in Ireland um, in terms of they're used to the studio setup, they're used to television shows, they're used to, you know, all that kind of stuff. That, and they, they tend to do quite well in front of sort of cameras, you know, a sort of a smaller setup. Um, I think it matters less when you walk out into the Eurovision stage because it's so different and so different in scale and in, you know, atmosphere and in vibe. I think that um, I think anything you've learned tends to go out straight out the door, you know, when when you see uh, when you just see the, uh, the, the setup in in um, in Turin this year or, you know, wherever, wherever it happens to be. But um, but it, of course it helps. Yeah, I mean, like, you, you know, the more experience you can get in front of a camera, the, the more confident you're going to be and the more capable you are of making that connection, you know. Excellent. Um, I think I'll bring back Adrian now for our final session on the Jukebox Jury at uh, this year's um, contest and discussing the various things. Now, uh, there are questions there that might relate to this session, um, but Adrian, if you want to get started. Yeah, thanks, Keelan. Uh... Some of the questions uh, you mentioned already. Uh, uh, Dermot Manning asked an interesting, sorry, interesting question, uh, Michael. Do heads of delegations have any right of appeal against the producer-led running orders? He follows on to say, if you get a bad draw one year, will the producers take that into account the following year? Well, we saw with Croatia. I don't think that's the case. But has there ever been uh, a kind of a... a a rollback against a running order decision, Michael. So say Brooke got number two in the final, hopefully she gets the final, she gets the number two position. Will you will you be shouting the odds? Uh, there's nothing you can do. Once they publish the running order, that's the running order. If they start unpicking it because yeah. people complain, then it's, a, it's, it's game over. You might as well just have a random draw because, you know, um, no. So once it's, once it's set, You've just got to bite your tongue and just live with it, you know. Um, nothing you can do, I'm afraid. 
And there's yeah. limited grounds of appeal. You know, you can appeal if jurors in other countries say things about your act before yeah. the show. You can appeal to get them removed or replaced or whatever. You know, you can. You know, we had an interesting case when Ryan was in in uh, in uh, Lisbon. The I think it was the Chinese broadcaster blocked blacked out his performance, as well as the Albanian one. Um, and, it was uh, the Jews for Albania, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we we kicked up a fuss about that, and um, we had the Chinese broadcaster barred from showing the final, or at least the EBU. Um, moved very quickly in that instance you know um but that kind of mm. that you know that kind of attention just before a final isn't necessarily a bad thing even if it's you know just yeah. anything that gives you a little bit of publicity for whatever reason sometimes can be a good thing no news is bad news uh there was another question i think i answered this last year as well about the idea of ireland sending an act performing in irish uh we do send acts performing in Irish to junior Eurovision, of course, because TG Carr is the host uh, broadcaster for that. But I think it's a case, as far as I remember last year, Michael, if there was a good song in Irish, say for this year, it would have been in the mix. Yeah, and, and we, we get very, very few songs sent into us in Irish. I mean, that's the reality of it, you know? So we don't get an awful lot of choice in terms of um, uh, people sending in, in songs for us. But like if 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 you get a good a good song is a good song in any language as Eurovision demonstrates every year, um, so there's no reason why we shouldn't have a song in Irish. It's just a matter of getting the right one, you know, uh, whenever it comes along. Okay, thanks for that, Michael. So now we move on to our last. We're only four minutes late, so surprise, surprise, we're actually fairly on time today. We're now moving on to the last section, which is our Eurovision jukebox jury and. Uh, hopefully, every all of our attendees or our participants will take part in this. Uh, some of you will have listened to the songs. Some of you will have listened to the songs more than I have done. Some of you will have done what Keelan did, and I think Johnny does it the same: blind listen to the songs without knowing what country it is, uh, so that you're not biased. Not that any of us are biased. Don't let Sweden win a seventh time. We're not biased <laughs> at all. Uh, so, if you have any comments, folks on what your favourite song is this year or who you think you're going to win. Again, post them in the chat section. If you can't find the chat section, I'll find your comments in the questions and answers. So please join in. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, who will we bother for? So the, the discussion really is, I don't want to hear your least favourite song. So we'll keep that out. It's just your favourite entries this year, but also the entries you think will win or potentially could win, even if you don't personally like them that much. So Rebecca, I'll put you in the hot seat first there, uh, because just because I'm nasty like that. And um, so, are we talking overall, or are we talking to get out of semi-final one and semi-final two? Uh, yeah, in terms of overall, but again, if you want to talk about semi-finals, um, I think your... I think, and everyone will probably agree with me, the semi-final one is obviously the title one to try and get out of. Uh, semi-final two, I think we're fortunate that we're in semi-final two. I don't think it's the strongest. Um, grouping of songs so I think it is easier to definitely get out of semi-final too um, songs that I really enjoyed that I've been listening to at length for weeks and weeks um, really like Armenia Rosalind Snap beautiful beautiful emotive song um, kind of that that like folksy Lumineers kind of mix I think it's really nice um, I don't know how the staging is going to work um, because in the video um She's in a house like an up, so she kind of like takes off into the sky. Not sure what's going to happen on stage. If it's a little bit flat on stage, then it's, um, you know, it's not going to do well. I love the big songs. I love um, Norway, so Bulfer, um, you know, like the, the the absurd is what I like in in Eurovision. So it's the two extremes. It's the the nice folksy ballads or the you know the absurd the the big um the big songs and the big show and the big production um love latvia eat your salad you know in semi final one i'm pretty sure it's in it's it's not in a great position to get out of um no it's number, it's two isn't it number two yeah 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 so i thought that that wasn't going to do very well um overall the songs that i think are going to be up there in the top 5 in no particular order we're going to have greece um, we are going to have 
Uh, Ukraine. Um, who else are we going to have? We're going to have Sweden. I know, I know I don't want it there, but we're going to have Sweden in the top five. Um, not that I don't like the song. It's just, I'm like Adrian, I wouldn't like them to rival our, our seven. Um, we're not going to have Ireland and putting it out there. Um, I'll, I'll get on to that again later. I think uh, we'll probably have a, you know, the two big songs, like maybe um, like Romania. Uh, Lama Mate, that's that's a quite a nice production. Um, I really like Israel, but again, that they're in they're in position two in semi final two. They'll get out of that for sure. Um, that's um, I am or I dot um, um, poor pronounce there for um, for grammar. But anyway, um, it's a great tune. It's a real club tune. It's um, like Halo for Austria again, big club tune. So, um, yeah, I've given you more than my top five. Um, mm. the song that I think will win probably ukraine okay, thank you, Rebecca. very detailed there uh did you expect anything less adrian no i didn't in turn. uh i'll switch over then to uh johnny uh what do you think uh johnny what's your sense of songs you like this year songs you think will win yeah, I think there's there's um yeah, I mean look the the the, the big hitting songs, the ones that you can you can tell from you know far way out are, are going to be there in in the contenders. Um, you know, I think everyone's expecting Ukraine. Ukraine is 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 there in the betting. Is there there is look as I say, Eurovision is a song contest, but it's more than a song contest. And I think it there's a, a big sympathy vote there. And to be honest with you, the Ukraine song, uh, I've always, Ukraine and Eurovision has always kind of been my second country, you know, I love their entries. Not as hot on this one when I heard it first. Um, it goes a little bit too ethnic at times. I'm, You know, Adrian, we had a Greek entry, was a golden boy a few years ago or that. was about Israel. Singing, Israel, yeah, Israel, sorry, yeah, singing about his mammy and stuff. Not big into that, not my scene. Um, but because of, of the situation Ukraine is in, this song is now taking on an entirely different meaning yeah. from what the lyrics were and that transcends something. So I think there's going to be a connection there that people it's becoming a bit of an anthem that maybe it wasn't when, when I heard it first. Uh, so I think that's definitely up there. It might just struggle though at some elements when people get into the contest and what they're enjoying in, in, in some parts of it. Um, one thing I'll say about all the big songs this year that I've noticed in the, the top kind of betting so far of the countries, it's a lot of slow songs, an mm. awful lot of slow songs. And there is a real opportunity if you get right in the running order, you come in between a raft of those slow songs. There could be periods where your Eurovision party is getting quite dead. Um, there's a lot of boys crying their eyes out over girls. There's a lot of broken hearted fellas singing in high pitched voices. You know, it's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. You kind of think, look, will it stand out? Difficult to see. For me, and I hate to say it, going to, I think Sweden are going to do it. Um, when I first heard the Swedish song, I was kind of, oh, well, you know, I've heard a few, they've had a few hit and miss in recent years. This one, this girl connects with the audience. She's a tough job at the beginning where it's a very delicate part of the song. So she doesn't go off key and doesn't sound off key in that. If she manages that, this song is all kind of, it's a hold me now kind of vibe because we're breaking up tomorrow and you have to leave me. But yeah, she's got connection. You do want to give her a hug by the time you're through the song. You're dancing around, the crowd will be clapping. It's got a bit more pace than the other songs. And I think people are going to want to give her a hug. And that's that's the important thing. Um, I think you've, you've got Greece in there. One to watch, um, Spain. Um, a bit dated as a club number. Um, a bit, you know, maybe a bit more of like 90s, early 2000s Beyonce kind of going on. Um, but again, it's one of the few big hitting numbers that are going to be in there. So it might stand out. She's a bit self-centered. It's all about how she's going to make you cry over and all this kind of thing. But, you know, in the Instagram world that we all live in, it's OK to be a bit self-obsessed. Um, Norway, Rebecca mentioned it. I'm going to give them a, a, a special mention. Them and, and Iceland as well. Lovely folk song in Iceland. Really good. Um, don't know how it'll translate, but it's nice. Kind of, it'll break up a lot of the other samey stuff that's going on. Norway, I'm just going to say this to you on Norway uh, for everyone that's out there, because to me, if I, I'm on the communication side of things, what I'd look at and say is, give me your song. Um, give me the singer. Give me the title. 
give me the theme, and then I'm going to figure out how we're going to settle this message across Europe to other people. And my first reaction when I would be, if I was handed Norway would be, good Lord, you know, what do you get? Give the wolf a banana? And these guys come out and they're wearing what I presume are wolf masks. Being Irish, I have no idea what a wolf looks like. So they look like foxes to me. So you're minding the chickens when they come out on stage more than anything. But once it went out, I thought I'd hate it. Um, I laughed. I don't think I've laughed so hard at a song all the way through it. And, and you're kind of going, oh, let's go back and eat grandma because grandma tasted the best. It's like, this is so bizarre. It's hilarious. And you actually fall apart. Amid a lot of boys crying over girls and being the same-ish kind of stuff, it's like, oh, do you know what, lads? It's nice for some lads to go out and have a bit of a laugh. They could surprise. And I just think there's a, there's a move. We, we, there is a lot of samey stuff in there, and it's the stuff that rises out of that that's going to be different. Yeah, a lot of people have said it's a very similar contest to 2015 when there was a lot of uh, very, a lot of, it was very ballad heavy as well. So really interesting points there, Johnny. Uh, I'll just go to some of the comments from the chat. Dermot said, I like Armenia too. And Armenia would be the first country to do the junior and senior contest double if they win. Yeah. Hard to see past the Ukraine win if they compete in Turin. I think Ukraine will be in Turin, even if they're not, because uh, they will play the recording from the national final. Uh, I think that's the general agreement. Raquel from Norway, hello to Norway. He says, I know you've spoken about block voting, but I'll admit, as a Norwegian, I'd never give my vote to Sweden unless they're a true standout like Euphoria. We're too competitive with them. Brilliant. Uh, Catherine, Armenia is very catchy, and I agree on Sweden. Slow burner, but gets in. Uh, Rackle again, he says, the front runner theory is that the Norwegian entry singers are Ilvis, who wrote the viral hit, What Does the Fox Say? See, Johnny, there is, you were on to some <laughs> great tune that. Where is the fox? And Dermot says, some of us are still pay paying off our credit card bills after also. <laughs> mm. Yikes. Uh, Michael, now, I don't know like whether you, uh, I, what, what's your favorite ones this year? Uh, because I think everyone's got their different styles. So just your own one. Uh, I won't ask you your least favorite. So we'll avoid any political controversies. Yeah, yeah, Leave yeah. that to Keelan. Um, I, I, you know, I have a, I have a, a few favorites. I, I, I try not to listen too much to all of the other songs until I get a little closer to the competition. Um, I, I will declare an interest though. I was on the Irish jury for the Swedish Melody Festival and that chose the, um, the Swedish entry. So I do quite like that. I have to say, um, I, I, I do like the Italian entry this year as well. I mean, I actually think Italy might be the first one to do it back to back. Since I don't know, Johnny or, or Keenan might know this. I think well, the last country to do back to back was it wasn't Ireland? No, it hardly. Was the tree in the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I I quite like the I quite like the Australian one again. It's a kind of a slow ballady song, and my my other favorite one is the one from the Czech Republic. Actually, I quite oh. like that. Um, Lights off. And yeah, I and I think that might do well actually. You know. Um, they're kind of my favourites, really, at the moment. Yeah. I, think the, I think Ukraine will definitely clean up on the on the telly vote. Um, no question about it. I just think that, um, just given what's going on, I, I, I think that that's, you know, the, fa the fact that if they turn up in Turin, which I'm, I'm sure they will, they were at the our online heads of delegation meeting there recently. Um, so they have every intention of being there. Um, so I think if they show up, I think they will do well. Yeah, uh, I think definitely the televote for Ukraine, I, I think where most people are fully expecting they'll do very well in the televote, probably win it. It's probably the jury vote. Uh, so how the jury votes go through that would be interesting to see. Uh, I don't know if any, anyone else has opinions on that. But uh, yeah, Ukraine definitely in the mix. Uh, I'll hand over to Keelan just to get her opinions and then we might come back to... Uh, some of the other comments from the chats then. So just back to Keelan there. So I'm giving my own opinions. Is it Adrian? My favourites from this year. Uh -huh. Oh God, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> he wants me to go on a rant about something or another. No, um, my favourites this year, I kind of, uh, Ukraine is obviously the standout, I think. Uh, well, from the, like the one that's kind of the front runner, but I'd be like you, Johnny, where when I first listened to it, I wasn't quite sure 
really like was it as good well it's definitely not as good as last year's entry I I, I loved last year's but I suppose what got me with that was because the past few years they have been sending solely Ukrainian acts and I think Adrian kind of touched on this like it's all like in Ukrainian there's no sort of English so I suppose it, they're tapping back to that culture and I think that's uh, as you were saying Johnny just echoing everything you're saying it it means more now than just a song contest as such for Ukraine within the Eurovision so I suppose they're a standout I actually don't have a favorite yet though that's one thing I've no none that I'm like drawn to and I'm like I definitely want that to win like I I do like Greece um, Sweden I blind listened to it and it was a song that I went into clicked into YouTube and I was like oh that's Sweden and um, Adrian would disagree with me on that one and um, but he didn't blind listen to it so there could be a touch of bias there and um, but Michael I'd agree with you with Italy I think um, Italy are excellent this year I think with Mahmoud returning he's got experience of doing incredible at the Eurovision and um, so I think he knows how to perform um, and I think the song itself, it's actually completely different from Saldi. It's completely different. Um, I think that's incredible. So they be my standouts. One that, and Rebecca, we might disagree on this, is the United Kingdom. I actually really like the United Kingdom. I know. Really? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, it just never gets going for me. I see. I don't, I think he's such a, I don't know. I think I've seen interviews with him and I think he's a free spirit or something. And when I saw the video, I was like, he could do. And I think it really depends on the stage and what they do on the night. And I think if the United Kingdom put a bit of heart and effort into it, I think they could create something really cool with that song. Now, I think it could either, like if they don't have the stage incorrect, I think it might not do well. But I do think that if they have the stage in spot on, I don't think they're going to win. Now, I definitely don't think they're going to win. But I do think that they could be, as I say, most improved from last year. It's not like they're kind of, and to be honest, which I wouldn't mind if they did have some sort of, because I think you do need that to kind of lift your spirits as well. And um, I do want to give a special shout out to Ireland because I actually think the entry this year is class. I, I really like it and I can't wait to see this staging. But um, I do think, yeah, with the numbers, um, but uh, like to our like the position that we're in but I think we've got an up-tempo song there's not many of them that I think uh, hopefully it could stand out maybe um but yeah so I think I don't have a favor essentially I'm just I'm undecided as of now which usually I kind of would have a standout for myself but I think this year I think that kind of makes an interesting year for me anyways because I you don't know who I think Ukraine might do it but I do think I kind of, when people are saying, oh, they'll definitely win, I'm always a bit sceptical of that. I'm very sceptical of people saying that, that I'm like, oh, I wouldn't be so sure. But yeah, so I don't know if you have any thoughts, Adrian, or anything to input to that. You're still remembering uh, uh, Occident, Occident oh, Helden, Karma. That was my biggest heartbreak. <laughs> yeah, the heart, the I've never seen Danny. a bad gorilla he, I, That was my favourite. And it's actually probably definitely my top it's one that I listen to if not every second day every day like you know it's it's one of them ones and I felt he was robbed I love the message I love the stage and I love Italy in the Eurovision Song Contest I think they're excellent that was a standout and I feel like I just it, I, it just made me so happy so yeah no I feel that everyone thought he was going to win and I actually thought it was a year that my favorite was going to win and it didn't so <laughs> I hold a grudge <laughs> That poor gorilla. The <laughs> sad gorilla in my life. Yeah. It's like just deflated. It's an interesting one because I'm kind of wondering with that one, it got ninth in the running order, which isn't that bad for because in the first half, but it wasn't in that sweet 10, 11, 12, 13 slot. So whether that had a fact, I think that possibly had an impact on Malta last year. They won their semi-final and they did very well in Televo in the semi-final. And then they got sixth in the running order and the televote just dropped dramatically. But there are things to think of. Uh, Dermot remembers the huge trumpets over the stage in Rotterdam as one of his favourites. No, uh, thought, yeah, that was England, wasn't it? That was, yeah, that was uh, James Newman. So someone like that's, maybe that's going against Shakina. It was memorable. Like the fact that things- Not a good memory. Was not a good memory. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> The staging and everything was just so cringy. I don't. It I, was. 
Oh, now, Dermot, you've got me started. This is the rant I had to end with. <laughs> <laughs> they were giving off about no one voting for them. And I was like, well, I'm sorry. If you look at Ukraine last year, like Italy last year, you do have a high and a low point there. <laughs> like, yeah. they're not really comparable at all. So they don't they don't make the effort in the same way. They, they have that same attitude. And it does happen to countries. If the general populace is not interested in it, you're not going to get the same level of entries, which means you don't get the same quality coming through, which means you don't have enough to select from and you don't have the, the throughput. For me, I, I, this year with the UK, look, the guy, Sam Ryder, problem for me is it's like they found a guy and said he's good on TikTok and he has a wonderful voice. But it's all about his voice. It's not about the song. The song has zero meaning. I'm a spaceman. And if I was in space, I'd talk to satellites. If that was a non-English speaker had written that song, I'd be saying, oh, well, you know, you always get dodgy lyrics in the Eurovision when they try to translate them to English. It's nonsense. Who'd be in space? And why would you talk to a satellite in the first place if you were up there? Don't get it. In a, in a Eurovision searching for meaning, I can't see them finding meaning in the UK song. Yeah, yeah 100%. Post Raquel, uh, again, hi again to Raquel, says this year's UK entry is one of my favourites. So it's interesting. They've actually, uh, I saw there on some of the Eurovision uh, fan websites like Eurovoix and uh, Wii Blogs, they were talking to one of the show producers and they said that the UK had big plans for their stadium this year. Uh, Armenia, which uh, Rebecca has noted about, mm -hmm. Armenia is closing semi-final one and it's kind of an unusual to close it because Okay, it's slightly up tempo, uh, up tempo, but it's not a big up tempo number. So it sort of suggests that Armenia have a good staging because they generally tend to, you tend to find the songs at the end. They want to, uh, they've got Finland at the start of our semi final, uh, the Rasmus. And again, they were talking about big ideas for staging. I saw they noted for last year, uh, Michael might have heard of this, that Italy sent an 88. 88 page document on how they wanted their act stage. So there is a lot put into this. Um, Raquel says, dodgy lyrics in Satellite by Lena, and it's still one. So Satellite's a phenomenal song. Yeah. It's and she's also a non English speaker. I think we, we have a certain kind of thing. You know, if I get a dodgy lyric, I don't mind a dodgy lyric from, you know, France or Italy or wherever you're going to say, well, in fairness, They've gone to the trouble of translating it to English, putting it in. It's something we've struggled to do is take any song and put it into German or Italian or anything else. So you kind of say you're going to get a, a dodgy lyric or two. When it's your native language, putting in dodgy lyrics, come on. Yeah. There's also a charm as well, I think, when, when non-native English speakers sing, you know, in, and, and the lyrics may not entirely make sense, but that's kind of part of the, so the charm of it, you know? Yeah, agree. With that, Michael. Uh, just again to say, uh, we've heard from a few people in the chat. If anyone else in the chat wants to give your suggestions about this year's entries, I'd be interested to hear what you've got to say. Uh, personally, my take on this year, the betting odds are usually, they, we get occasional exceptions like that sad gorilla for Italy there a few years ago, where, and Italy still did quite well that year, but uh, it, they were really strong favourites, but the other thing to note is things do change quite a bit. We're talking about the contest now. It's it's like, remember that Father Ted, what time is your vision on? And it's actually a few weeks away. Uh, uh, we're talking about it now. It's was it, it's another five, six weeks into the final. So we're still a long way out. And things Tickets haven't even gone on sale, Adrian. Yeah, yeah. Things, <laughs> things do uh, change quite a bit once we start hearing the rehearsals. So... Uh, I, you do get the occasional songs are big growers like to come up the odds. Ukraine last year, Cyprus uh, with uh, Fuego there back in uh, 2018 came from probably mid odds to it was actually the favorite before the contest before they lost out to Israel. Uh, so things can change, and I'm going to use that as a preface for my take on things. Uh, usually, I think the betting odds are a good indicator because even look at last year. Uh, Malta were the pre-contest favourites now. They got overtaken during the betting odds as the rehearsals, week, two weeks of rehearsals and contests went on. And by and large, the betting odds last year had a fairly bang on. The countries that were at the top, uh, Italy, France, Switzerland, were also at the top when it came. So sometimes I think the betting odds, you need to look at them. Uh, but the bet, betting odds don't always pay off. Like, I remember... 2018 with Ryan, uh, I kind of look at the betting odds 
in terms of our own chances a lot of the times. And I'm kind of looking, I was looking at the betting odds and they kept saying, Ireland's not going to qualify, Ireland's not going to qualify. I went, oh, not again. I, I saw our performance in the night and said, oh, that's, it's got a great reaction. It's check the betting odds, Ireland's not going to qualify. And then literally we're called out last in that semi-final. It's kind of like, whoa. <laughs> Adrian, um, sorry to interrupt you, but do you think the betting odds sometimes, and I look at them mm. too, obviously, and I think that's based on a lot of historical yeah. performance as opposed to how people think the song is going to, they just go, oh, well, Ireland won't qualify, so we won't bet on that. Sweden yeah. will always qualify, we'll bet on that. Mm -hmm. Malta, as you remember last year, the, the scandal spent hundreds of thousands betting on their own song, you know? Which is so, a way... It didn't sort of work because it built up hype for the song. It's the contest favourite. Yeah. It worked, yeah. Well, no, absolutely it worked, yeah. I mean, but it didn't It didn't translate to a win, but it translated to a very decent performance in the final. But um, but anyway, I, I I would hope that we would perform better than our betting odds. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I said, with our song, I like our song. I voted for it on the night. I'm just hands up there. Uh, I was very relieved when the televote came in that night. <laughs> And thanks to the international jury vote. Uh, so I'm kind of hoping it's, as Johnny's know, there's a lot of balance this year. I'm hoping that we can stand out, we can make it to the final, and then hopefully we get a better running order. We're in the second half of the contest, which is good. But as I said earlier on, we're actually the first act in the second half. So would have loved to be in the Czech Republic's position. But I'm hopeful, like, uh, Brooke is someone who's, has experience performing live. She finished third in the Vice UK. It's a big contest. So uh, I know we tend to get a lot of Vice, former the Vice acts. Uh, Ryan, of course, was came from Britain's Got Talent. But sometimes having that experience is a big thing when it comes to moving on to Eurovision. So I'm hopeful for our chances. I would have been a lot more hopeful if the running order had been kinder. If we'd been, if we'd got the Czech Republic slot in the semi final, I'd have been thinking. Uh, I'd have been literally saying mm, we're ninety percent chance. It tent makes the bit. There's not that many up tempo acts, but there's quite a few in semi final too. Romania is in that similar run. It's kind of halfway. Uh, you've Israel as well, and then you've acts like uh, you've Israel as well, um, and Finland. Well, it's heavy metal. It's a bit different type of up tempo. So, uh, if you get to the final, hopefully you can get in a position in the running order where a lot of those ballads that Johnny was talking about, hopefully we can go on and do something. Uh, but that's my take on it. Uh, in terms of the country, so very long preamble, countries I think will do, I think Ukraine's going to do well this year. Uh, like if you were, I was forced to name the country I think will win, I'd say Ukraine, not just solely on a sympathy of both factor, I think Ukraine as Johnny and all the others have said, Ukraine always does well. Ukraine really, really know how to do Eurovision. They always seem to have some controversy with their national selection. Uh, the song, a lot of times you hear the song, a lot of times you hear the song and you're thinking, first of all, oh, it's not that great. Maybe Ukraine won't qualify from the semi-final year, this year. Ukraine always get out of the semi-final. They're the only country in Eurovision now uh, that's got out, has qualified from every semi-final they competed in. Uh, so, other than that, uh, I hate to say it, based on the feed, the, sorry to all these Swedish people, uh, based on the kind of reaction in, on, on, on social media, Sweden looked like they have a good chance of doing well. Like, I wish them well, like, please finish second, third, fourth, fifth, don't win again. Don't take our rock yard, it's all we have. Uh, something like, well, I'm sure we've other things as well. Um, uh, other than that, I like really like my favorite two very different. It's like some of the others named two favorites are very different. I like those space werewolves from Norway, I, and it's a very earnest Eurovision this year. Very earnest, not bad. It's, it's a very serious Eurovision. So sometimes when things are bad, when you've got war, when you've got COVID still around, sometimes you just need to cheer yourself up and the act. That's probably most likely to cheer yourself up this year, probably Norway. And they really, really, it's sometimes you can have a novelty act and it's badly staged, but they really, they really stage it well. My favorite of the others last year was Greece, but for a different reason. Good Bob, really good Bob. And I liked their staging. This year, 
really good. I think the standout of the ballads for me by far this year, personally, uh, it's Greece again. Uh, so they're, they'd be my favourites. And I think Italy's going to do very well. Uh, I think Keelan mentioned it yesterday in our discussion we had for another thing we're doing. There's been a tendency. The usual rule of thumb was the host country did really bad the following year. But the tendency in the last 10 years is the host country does bad the year that they're hosting. It's always seems to be a drop in Netherlands last year, for instance, they were one of the four countries got the nil pot from the televote. The only two years that Ukraine has done bad in Eurovision is the two years they've hosted. Uh, so there's something in that, but this year I think will be the exception that proves the rule. Uh, possibly our best, e even if they don't win it, possibly the best result for a host country at Eurovision, possibly since Ireland in 2007, sorry, 1997, UK in 1998, but someone will correct me on that. So there are my takes on it. Uh, uh, just seeing any final comments from the chat. Uh, so before I, well, it's half 11 now, I know everyone wants to get on with the rest of the day. Uh, before I finish off, Keen and I finish off, I'll just hand back to the panelists, our guest panelists particularly, uh, Rebecca, Michael, and Johnny, to see if you have any final comments. So we'll start with uh, Johnny first, please. Um, well, look, I suppose you know, it's just great to have the contest back. And of course, great to have it back after the pandemic. Some people actually feel like they can enjoy Europe Eurovision properly, both in terms of the crowd um, uh, 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 engagement at it. And I think for everybody at home, having your Eurovision party again, being able to meet up, being able to do things again. It's just going to be a wonderful uh, feeling as part of that, even if it is slightly overshadowed by all that's going on at the the, the rest of Europe. Um, but I think I, I, I'll say one final point. I hope, like every year, I would hope Ireland um, can get out. It always adds a bit to have the, the country there. I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not sold on it this year. I, I, I think one of the great tragedies Eurovision is when someone wins with a song, in the years after you see people copying it, I think we're way too close to Netta and Israel's uh, song. I think as soon as people hear it, they go, Ireland's just copying Israel. It's been done before. And when Eurovision, something's done, I think it's hard to get Eurovision fans back on board that train again. That said, it was the best we had in our, our, our national selection, uh, without doubt. Um, deserve to go through on that basis and maybe that's something we got to look at in in, in the future still but uh, it's a tough nut to crack but i think look overall just brilliant to be back with your vision and brilliant to see the contest back and, and and hear the songs and i think everyone will be just looking forward to it thanks johnny uh rebecca any final comments please um yeah so just just on that what johnny said like i i didn't vote for for book um to get out it's um i voted for rachel i thought it was a, a better song um I, I do think now the book obviously is going, I, I hope in the production that a little bit of that auto-tune, a little bit of that Netta-esque vibe is toned down a little bit because, um, you know, I, I do think that we are going to be seen to um, to imitate Netta and having seen Netta perform live, like, you know, um, it, it's, a you know, they're big shoes to fill. Um, and I think if the auto-tune was, was dialed back a little bit, that, that would allow Brooke to own the song a little bit more. Um, having said that, I'm just really excited. Like, it's the Eurovision. I'm always excited about the Eurovision. I'm really excited to see the, the production. Like, Rotterdam was just phenomenal. Like, you know, um, like it was so diverse, um, you know, transgender host and everything. I'm just really excited to see what what Italy and Turin bring because at the end of the day it is a song contest it is about the um, participants but at the end of the day it's like for everyone around the world it's a celebration of inclusivity diversity acceptance and I think the whole show and the production really adds to that so for everyone in their Eurovision party wherever they have it I just I'm looking forward to like a big spectacle a big a big production and a big performance. Thanks Rebecca and Michael any final comments from you please? No, I mean, like Johnny and Rebecca, I'm just delighted it's back um, seemingly on a, on a kind of a normal basis um, for the first time in a couple of years. Um, I think just given what's going on in Eastern Europe and Russia, I think it's it's probably something we need more than ever, you know, in terms of showing people just, you know, how united really we all are uh, when it comes to art and music and, uh, and, and song and, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what the panel thinks, just the final one, what the panel thinks of the exclusion of Russia from it. But um, 
the I just think that coming together, showing countries coming together in in the spirit of of um, diversity and inclusion and togetherness, I think is just brilliant. You know. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, so, last of all, I'll hand back to Keelan for any final words, and then we'll wrap up with the thank yous to. So over to Keelan. Yeah, so I'm quite excited for this year's contest as well. Um, it's both back to. Um, I always enjoy these because everyone has such different opinions. Like I feel like I I love songs that other people don't. Other people don't. I think that's the spirit of Eurovision as such. It's just kind of that conflict. Um, I know myself and Adrian usually have a similar palette when it comes to. That's why I'm kind of in doubt about your feelings about Sweden this year, Adrian. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm quite excited to just watch it and just be back to that sort of. The, back to the fun of Eurovision because I do agree with everything that's happening with Ukraine and Russia um, I do think it is something that we do need um, and as a musician I do think music does bring people together um, I think it's really important and it's the reason why the competition was set up in the first place it was established to you know bring people together after the war so I think yeah definitely I'm very excited for it so um, yeah so I suppose that's me wrapping up now Adrian um, I just want to thank before he he says thank yous because he never thanks himself. I just want to thank Adrian for organizing this. He's um the brains behind it. He said I was, but um he's definitely the brains behind it. I want to thank our three panelists, Rebecca, Johnny, and Michael. Thank you so much for joining in. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversations. I really enjoyed them so much. It's always great to bring people together about Eurovision. And then of course, I cannot forget um, Anne and Orla from Mussy. Thank you so, so much. Um, you make um, you made this incredibly easy for myself and Adrian because we're not um, we're not technologically advanced at all. <laughs> it's not our strong point. But I want to thank everyone attending today, asking the questions, of course, because you kept the conversation going too, and I really enjoyed the input. So thank you. So thanks, Keenan. So again, I'd like to personally thank. Rebecca, our debut panelist this year. Thank uh, you for having me. And thank you uh, to Johnny, who's been at every Eurovision conference we've done so far, the two in-person ones, which were 2016, 2017, and the, the last two online ones. And thanks to Michael, who's been at nearly every Eurovision conference we've organized. He's been at uh, the last three. Uh, so thanks very much, like brilliant discussion. Like we've gone, sorry, 10 minutes over time. Uh, um, I thought we'd finish on time, so I don't want to take up anyone else's time more any more than this. Uh, just to thank everyone for the thank yous. Thank Raquel said thank you all for a very intelligent and fun discussion of Eurovision. Nessa says thank you everyone. A great chat about all things Eurovision. A thank you from Katie. Uh, Emina said thank you everyone for this interesting discussion. Uh, Captain says thanks to Adrian and all in the panel. It has kicked off the Eurovision countdown for me the last few years. So thanks to everyone uh, for your contributions. All our people who turned up to listen in today. Uh, thanks to all everyone for the questions. Again, a big thank you to Michael, to Rebecca and Johnny. Like without you, it would have been just me and Keelan, Keelan and I talking to each other and that would not be good. It would, it would end badly. Thanks to Keelan for all our work. Uh, Keelan is becoming, is, she's quickly taking over from me as the department expert on Eurovision. Thankfully, uh, I'm losing the hair and you need some younger person involved. Uh, oh, by the way, Dermot says, terrific discussion. Many thanks to everyone. Thanks, Dermot. Eva says, thanks all. And Orla says, thank you all. And thanks again, everyone. Finally, last but not least, thank you to Orla and Anne for all your help in putting this together. Like, if I was to do this, I'm sure Keelan would sort it out, but if I was to do this on my own, I'd be still crying at this stage because I can't get Zoom to work. So without the work of Orla and without the work of Anne, and especially not just the work in terms of organizing Zoom, the work in developing the marketing for today's conference, uh, without you guys, there would have been no conference. So a big thank you to Anne and Orla. Thanks again, Michael. Thanks again, Rebecca. Thanks again, Johnny. And a big thank you to Keelan. And thank you everyone for taking part, for offering questions, offering comments. That's it. It's uh, Arriva Derchi from Ireland. Au revoir. Sloan Lat. And goodbye. I would say good night.
but even though it's a Eurovision, it's a Jorvi night event, it's in the morning. So good morning and thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks Adrian. Hey, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Adrian.